So in our last episode with Shaka Smart, we were discussing identity, team culture time, building relationships, uh, executive coaching, and morning routines. If you missed it, be sure to go back and listen before you jump into today's episode. Because in today's episode, we're really going to dive into how coaches navigate, honestly, the hard shit in coaching, like losing, uh, not feeling like we have done enough or we're doing a good enough job, or just the reality that we can always be better, right? Um, now, you're going to hear throughout the interview, Shaka just keeps coming back to the mindset and the behaviors and the personal disciplines that he has for himself. Things like journaling and how he encourages not only you know other coaches to do these, but he's encouraging his, his players to build these disciplines in their life. Um, so today's episode is not just a bunch of coaching cliches. Shaka is, is really going to show you how to live those principles out, how to become not just an effective leader, but become a better human being. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. My name is JP Nurbin, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nate Sanderson, our other co-host, Betsy Butterick, sat this interview out. Uh, she'll be back next episode. The mission of this podcast is to help you grow as a leader and create a stronger team culture. If you want the notes to this and every episode of the podcast, go to tocculture.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter there. Also at the website, you can learn more about TOC, our online courses for coaches, my books, The Culture System and Sports Parent Solution, as well as the executive coaching services that I offer. Enough about that. Let's get into the second part of our conversation with Shaka Smart. One of my questions for you today was, and I think you kind of answered it, which is how do you sustain such high energy as a coach? Because everyone knows that, you know, Shaka Smart is this guy that is a high, ener high energy coach. He's animated. He's really into it. He's always bringing 100% in his practices, in his games. You know, I, I guess that's kind of, the, it starts with the morning routine. Would you say there's anything else that helps you to sustain that? And, and then another question I'm going to tack onto that is just, when it does it become the responsibility of players to to bring the energy to, and how do you navigate that yourself too? Is because especially we as coaches, we you know, we're human beings, we have highs and lows as well. Yes. Well, I mean, what you just hit on, JP, is it's kind of the um, the paradox of coaching. It's wow, like I'm a human being. This guy I'm coaching is a human human being, and we have to have a level of acceptance for some of the flaws and frailties and limitations that people have at the same time. It's like not good enough. Um, I'll share this with you. And, and, and this is something um, I think I might've, I don't know if I've shared this publicly at all, but I've definitely told our players and, and coaches um, a few months ago, I woke up, at like two in the morning and I kind of turned over and I said to my wife, I said, not good enough. It's okay. And I said those two things, not good enough. It's okay. And really then I thought about it. Like, wow, well, I was in an interesting place. I thought about it um, later that morning. It's kind of like the story of a lot of our lives. You know, it's like we're trying to be better. Uh, we're trying to grow. We're trying to help others do the same. But at the same time, we have to get to a place of acceptance like it's OK so that we don't jump off the top of the building, you know. And um, I don't think that I'm alone in that. I think that's most people. I mean, it's a lot of us try to, like, personalize, you know, what we're dealing with or go through. But. You know, it's I think it's pretty consistent with with what different folks go through um, in terms of the energy. Sorry, it, let me just jump in real quick there, because I think you touched on something that, it, that we've talked about. Actually, we did a podcast episode just Nate and I maybe uh, you know, six months ago, which was titled When Is It Enough? You know, because I think at the end of the day, as coaches, we're constantly wrestling with that question of when is it enough? Right. It's not good enough. But at some point in our, our coaching journey and in our day, we have to say, this is enough. I'm going to stop watching film. I am going to stop, you know, for today, pushing this individual here. Like, where do you find that contentment? Not complacency, but it, you know, what do you find contentment in as a coach? 
Well, I mean, everything, and I, my staff gets tired of hearing me say this. Uh, life is about three A's. Awareness, acceptance, and then action. Because we could all sit on top of a mountain and meditate and work on our awareness and our acceptance of what is. But we wouldn't really be getting much done and we really we wouldn't really be helping others. So that last day is important. You know, you got to be able to take action. But it's it certainly, at least in my opinion, is a function of the first two. And so you better work hard on those first two if you want to be good at the third. And this actually applies to your question about energy and enthusiasm. Um, and so the way I like to think about it um, is there's big okay, like okay, and there's a little okay. And so to use a basketball example, Nate will, will, will chuckle at this. It's not okay to turn the ball over. <laughs> so like if we throw the ball the other team, that's not okay. Like we've got to, we got to work on that. We got to get better at that. At the same time, turnovers happen. And I was listening to a podcast actually yesterday, Stan Van Gundy. And he said, if we coach our guys, you know, with such control that you can never turn the ball over. Now they're not going to be willing to make that pass, that backdoor pass, because they're afraid that coach is going to yell at them there's a chance they turn the ball over. And so we're constantly kind of toggling back and forth from that's not okay, but it is big. Okay. Like, and again, big. Okay. The best I can explain it is across the street from me. I can see it in the window right there. There's this beautiful church. I mean, beautiful um, on our campus here at Marquette. And I would say, if you went up to the very top of the church, you went up on the roof, you'd probably be up at about, I don't know, 100 feet up in the air. So big OK means I'm not going up there and jumping out onto the street. And, and I mean, that's I'm not joking. Like, that's that's a real thing. I mean, that, to be honest, for all of us like that kind of has to be a foundational level that we can continue to function, you know, and go on with our lives. And so ultimately, whatever occurs has to be big OK. Otherwise, what's the alternative? At the same time, whether it's turnovers, whether it's watching tape, whether it's whatever it is that we talk about, maybe we do need to be better and want to be better if we want to create the outcomes that we say we want to create. I want to ask you two questions here about those other two values here of growth and victory because I think they both come with a, another side and you kind of alluded to this already, you know, talking about turnovers and you're right in my wheelhouse there of that the reaction when we turn the ball over. Um, but growth requires failure. Like it requires players and coaches to try new things and take risks to be able to learn from, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And we don't want guys that are locked up with fear, you know, that they're going to come out or they're going to get yelled at or, you know, because we, we have to, try new things in order to grow. So how do you coach that growth mindset and sort of the acceptance of or the willingness to navigate failure with your guys that are coming in as you're coaching them? Well, I think the first thing is just you emphasize it, you know, and, and you know, I don't know if Carol Dweck defined it this way, but we gave growth mindset the definition, I can and will grow from any experience. And so we emphasize the heck out of that. I think a lot of us, have a natural default to a fixed mindset. So in other words, we kind of view ourselves or judge ourselves based on the last result or what happened recently. And as we know, that can be very, very dangerous and it can get in the way of growth. So instead, even if you had a great game or a great week or a great test or whatever it was, I still can and will grow from that experience. And if you had a terrible game or a terrible test or a terrible week, I can and will grow. So emphasize the heck out of it. Um, you know, I think learning from her, um, really rewarding and incentivizing the controllable parts of growth, you know, like effort, um, 
like really being willing to get close to failure and and look at it and um, analyze it, um, learn from it, as opposed to pushing it away. And then, you know, being and this is a tricky one in sports because we are very outcome oriented, but being careful, um, putting something in front of the whole team as like the be all and end all of like, hey, we've we've gotten to the finish line like we've we've done, we've arrived. Uh, we've got a great mental skills coach that works with our team here at Marquette. He works with a bunch of different NBA and, and college players and teams. His name is Russ Roush. He's out of the Chicago area. I got to plug his app. He's got a great app called Vision Pursue um, that's got a bunch of really good stuff on it. Uh, but one of the things he did with us in his first year working with us that I thought was really interesting is he put the season before on a graph. And he charted it from the standpoint of emotional highs and emotional lows. And as you can imagine, like the graph was kind of like the stock market, you know, this big win over this team, you're up. And then, this, you know, this you lose to your rival, you know, opponent, you're down. And so we talked about it and we said, you know, this is going to be most seasons, right? You know, there's going to be ups and downs. Um, and you're a human being, so there's, there's there's going to be an emotional reaction to that. Um, but then one of the things that we talked about looking at that on a screen is what games did we learn the most from? And if you do that with your season or even your career or, um, you know, I know for me as a head coach, I've had one losing season. Learn the most from that season of any season I've ever coached. In fact, we have a 26 page culture document that we use and follow and, um, and teach off of every single day. That culture document came directly out of that losing season. Um, because that year there was a lot of cultural, you know, uh, things going on that were not who I wanted us to be. And so I had to, you know, really think deeply about, well, how can we be the opposite of what I don't want us to be. Um, so I think those are ways to emphasize the growth mindset. Uh, but it is a real challenge because, you know, let's be honest, when you get on your cell phone and you go on the internet or you go on social media, uh, that is not growth mindset stuff. That's fixed mindset stuff. Hmm. I love what you shared there. And, and you mentioned losing um and you know you were an assistant coach for for 10 years and and then you get your first job at vcu and just like anybody else i don't know what it was like for you but you know you get the job and you think we're gonna win a lot of games here and then you lose your first one you know and it it can be a little bit tough right and and so you know when you think about like just that experience of your first year as a head coach um and losing you know some games that season compared to how you maybe process losing now has there been a, a change in your, your thinking or kind of your relationship with the other side of victory, which is there are losses involved for somebody every time we take the floor to compete? Absolutely. I'll tell you a short story. So I got the head coaching job at VCU at 31 years old. In a lot of ways, I was not particularly well prepared to be a head coach. Um, you know, and when I was offered the job, um, part of me was like, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't, you know, but what are you going to do? Turn down the VCU job as an assistant coach? Like who, who am I to, to turn that job down? So, and I knew I wanted to be a head coach at some point. I was actually working for Billy Donovan, who was like a coaching idol of mine. Um, and I had just got there a year before. So my plan was to stay there for five, eight, 10 years, learn from him. And then I would be ready. But life doesn't always give you opportunities when you expect them. And so fast forward to the start of that season, we won our first game. It was what's called a guarantee game where you pay maybe a smaller school, a certain amount of money. They come and play you at your place, but you don't have to go back and pay the, play them at their place. So we won that game. And so we're one and oh, and you feel good. And, you know, as everybody knows, it's been a first time head coach there's a honeymoon that accompanies being undefeated. <laughs> and so the next game we were playing at Western Michigan, we went to Western Michigan, 
we had a double digit lead. I think we were up by as much as 12 in the second half. We end up losing the game by, I think, 16. Or we I might have it the other way around. We were up 16 and lost by 12. But it was literally nearly a 30 point swing in the second half, which, again, me now, that's my responsibility. Like, <laughs> like that's on me. Uh, I cannot. I have to do more. I have to do better. I have to help our team uh, to keep us from <laughs> giving up a lead, double-digit lead, and then losing by double figures. So anyway, we fly back. Um, don't get much sleep that night, tossing and turning like every coach knows. Um, and then we had Oklahoma coming to play us in the next game in in, in a few days. And so my alarm goes off at six o'clock. Uh, hadn't slept much, maybe fell asleep a little bit, like at the at the very end there, right before the alarm went off. I literally, guys, felt paralyzed. Like I didn't feel like I could get out of bed. I I, I was like locked up. I was my I was sweating. My mind was like racing. Um, I was not in a very confident place. We had Oklahoma coming in. They were a top 20 team in the country at that point. And I was in a dark place. And so I'm just kind of laying there and I'm kind of, you know, twisting and turning. And my wife was already awake. And at some point she came back into our room and she looked at me and she's like, get your ass up. And that was really helpful for me. I try to do what my wife says. So I got up and continued, you know, just with the day. And at that time, I did not have a morning routine. I was still young enough to think I could just roll out of bed, go to work and be my best. Um, we end up winning the Oklahoma game by double figures. Um, the students stormed the court. It was a big win. And um, now we're two and one. And I've been a head coach for three games <laughs> and I've already gone through this incredible roller coaster. And so, yeah, I mean, processing losing um, is something that that I've had to learn. I, I When I was younger I, as a player and even as an assistant coach, I was not good about losing. I, I didn't treat people the right way after losing. Um, I've gotten much, much better in the way that I treat others. Still working on how I treat myself <laughs> after a loss, but I've made a lot of progress. I just incredibly grateful for that vulnerability and honesty, just to admit that, right? Like so often when we lose, um, whatever about the anxiety and the stress, you know, we go off and we take it out on people that are really important to us, whether it's our players, our staff, or our spouse or children um so you've had that growth you know you're still working on the self-compassion thing uh i think we all are how do you how do you grow from that because so many coaches out there they're 60 70 years old and they're still haven't figured that out how to handle losing in the right way well there's a great clip you guys have probably watched it of kobe bryant doing an interview talking about the air balls that he shot in the last game of the playoff series against the Utah Jazz his rookie year. And one of the things that he repeats, he says it about two or three times, is get over yourself. Like, you're not that important. Get over yourself. It's the same thing with us as coaches when we lose a game. Get over yourself. Like, mm -hmm. Literally, there's war going on across the world <laughs> there's famine in various countries there's people traveling thousands of miles to try to find a home that's livable and sustainable um and we lost a game and you can't get out of bed mm -hmm. or you can't bring yourself to treat people the right way or treat yourself the right way get over yourself <laughs> so mm -hmm. i think if you haven't watched that clip, um, you got to watch it. You got to show it to your team and you got to rewatch it often. Um, I think the morning routine, the morning after the loss can help you with that. 
Um, you know, part of self-compassion is allowing yourself to feel what you feel for a certain amount of time. Because, you know, one thing that one of my mentors, Dr. Burrell, taught me is that when desire is high and expectations are high and you don't win, you're going to be upset. It's like a mathematical equation. That's how the mind works. Desire was high. Expectations were high. You didn't get what you wanted. So guess when you won't be upset anymore? When you stopped desiring and expecting to win last night's game or two nights ago's game. And that's why it's easier to accept a game from a month ago than it is to accept a game from last night. Now, those of us that are coaches, we still, we can get in that mode where we start thinking about that last second shot or that play that I should have diagrammed better. And then we go back to like it was last night. <laughs> but um, you mentioned self-compassion. There's a great professor at Texas. Uh, I used to coach there named Kristen Neff. And she wrote a book called Self-Compassion. And then she wrote a companion to that book that I would recommend for all coaches or anyone pursuing something hard. And it's called the Self-Compassion Workbook. And it basically is a little booklet that can take you through learning to treat yourself better. <laughs> and if, again, if you're someone pursuing something hard, it's helpful. Mm. Yeah. And there has to be some of that self-compassion for her to have compassion for others. Right. So, so many, so many good things there. So many questions, but two questions to get you out uh, of the door here. Cause I know you have other things to do today and we appreciate your time. Um, one question for me, one question from Nate, just when I think about coaches that I've worked with, I've, I've coached some of your competition as well, some of the other coaches out there in the league. And there's a lot of frustration around college sports today, especially college basketball and college football. And a lot of reasons that people are looking to maybe get out of the, the profession. Yet you seem as energized and excited to be out there coaching today as ever. And, and it's truly awesome to, to watch you and to see you in press conferences and it's inspiring. So what's keeping you in coaching? What's keeping you excited as there's so much transition and change within the league? Well, you know, I tell our staff this often. We were all chosen to be in our current roles. So, you know, a few years ago, the athletic director chose me to be the coach at Marquette, the president. Um, you know, I chose our assistant coaches to be here. We chose our players to be here. So it didn't happen by accident. At the same time, every day, we choose to be here. And that is an intentional, conscious choice. If you make that choice unconsciously, then you need to wake up. And at any time, you can choose to do otherwise. And there's coaches that have done that. There's athletes that have done that. It certainly is or can be, I guess, an unsettling landscape in 2024 in college athletics. But if you choose to be frustrated by that, then you're going to be frustrated. Uh, it's like we tell our daughter, my wife and I have a daughter named Zora. If you're bored, you're boring. You know, if you choose to be bored, then you're boring. Well, if you choose to be frustrated, then you're going to live a frustrating existence. And the reality is like, you see those pictures behind me? Like, those are all guys that I've coached over the years. And they have given me so much more, infinitely more than I've given them. And the guys that I'm coaching today, we've got workouts in a, an hour or so. They're going to do the same thing. And in a matter of years, hopefully there'll be pictures of them on the wall. And if I'm dwelling in frustration for one second while we're trying to go do something hard, Beating teams in the Big East is hard. Making the NCAA tournament, advancing in the NCAA tournament is hard. Having theories about winning and having theories about culture is easy. That's easy. That's why I asked you guys the question I did before we got on camera. It's easy to write a book about culture. It's hard to go execute it. Our culture docs, 26 pages, 
that's worth nothing unless we can bring it to life. So being frustrated certainly is not going to help us do that. Well, and you described those relationships where players are giving you as much life as sometimes we feel like we're giving away. And that that certainly is rewarding, you know, in and of itself. Shock, I want to get you out of here on this. I'm going to bring it back full circle a little bit. We, we talked about kind of your upbringing here, and we've sort of referenced the fact that you were an assistant for a number of different head coaches before getting your first opportunity at VCU. So I just want to run through the resume here real quick, the four coaches that you've worked for, and just ask maybe what's one of the most significant things that you learned from that coach, working with that coach, that has kind of shaped you today? And, and I want to start with, with Bill Brown. Oh, he was the best, the best. He recruited me. He's the coach that was the reason that I went to Kenyon College. And then he's the one that left after my freshman year, and I cried for three days. Um, biggest thing he taught me was what it means to see something in someone that they don't see in themselves. Uh, one time we were together uh, with some people from Kenyon College. Um, I, I was recently graduated and it's a division three school, small school in Ohio. And one of the people said, Hey, Shaka, you know, if you keep working hard and coaching, you know, maybe you could be the head coach of Kenyon someday. And I was about to say, you know, thank you. And coach Brown cut me off. And he, he, he said to the guy, he used to call everyone, bud. he said, nah, bud. He said, Shaka's going to do a little better than that. Hmm. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time, being 22 years old. But he would see things in people that they didn't necessarily see in themselves. And that's what I've tried to, to take from him. How about Oliver Purnell? OP. Um, both those guys truly, for me, have been father figures. Uh, he put his arm around me as a young guy. I'd never been at the Division One level. That was my first time. Uh, the University of Dayton is a special place uh, for basketball fans, administration, players. Um, it's a lot like Marquette. Mm -hmm. And uh, for him to give me that opportunity was special. Uh, I think the biggest thing I take from OP is um, his ability to see the program uh, truly like a uh, like a fortune 500 company from the standpoint of um, needing to oversee many, many different components of the program, needing to delegate in the right way, um, needing to communicate with people in the right way and not necessarily trying to control every little aspect, hiring good people, letting them work, empowering them. He was great at all that stuff. Hmm. About Keith Dambro. So you missed one. I worked for Dan oh. Hipsher first at Akron. Okay. Um, and I have a very specific one that I learned from him. Yeah. He was a motion offense coach. Mm. And I worked for him for one year. And man, he has so many different concepts. He was a Bobby Knight disciple. And so many different concepts of that particular type of offense that I took from him that's really, really powerful that, that, that I still try to utilize today. Keith Dambrot. Um, was the, the guy that I was closest with. Uh, Oliver Purnell and Bill Brown were like fathers to me, but Keith Dambrot was like my brother. Um, man, uh, so many great stories about Keith. But the biggest thing that I took from him by far, he's the best at this, spending time with players. Mm. He used to emphasize it every day to me and the rest of the staff. And, you know, it, it sounds so basic, but he'd be like, we got to spend time. We got to spend time. So every day at lunch, we would walk to wherever the players were eating and we would eat with them. And I've never been around a head coach um, where the players came into his office as much as they came into Keith's office. And that was really his secret sauce. Hmm. All right. Last one. We got to get you out of here. How about Billy D? Oh, man. <laughs> Well, I spent a year with him. It was a special year for me uh, from the from the standpoint of just uh, coaching, education. Um, the mental and psychological part of the game, getting into the minds of players and trying to, as he would say, positively affect the minds of players. 
you know, I can still hear this ringing in my head. Hey, shop, the most important thing you can do as a member of our staff is positively affect the minds of our players. Well, that's a powerful statement, you know, positively affect the mind. How do you do that? Well, as a young assistant, I was, you know, pretty naive. Um, and I learned a lot from him just being around him and, and watching him interact with guys and listening to his day. You know, every coach kind of structures their day differently. Um, my day tends to be pretty regimented. You know, I had, you know, this Zoom on the calendar from 9 to 10. I have meetings with players. I have different. Billy's day is fascinating. He would sit in his office and between, you know, he worked out a lot. But when he was in his office, between when he got there early in the morning until practice started, was conversations with people coming in and out of the office. It was not structured. It was not planned. But it was the trainer. It was the strength coach. It was the assistant coaches. It was players. It was support staff. And it was so powerful, those conversations. And those would structure and create the way that the practice and the messaging to the players went. And while he was having those conversations, he was listening, but he was also formulating what he wanted to do to message his team and his players. Um, and probably the coach more than anyone that taught me that coaching your team is not the same as coaching your players. Mm -hmm. I love everything you shared there. It really reinforces the importance of coaching conversations, which we talk a lot about. So I appreciate you uh, coming on here and having this incredible conversation. For the record, your answer to the question, who am I? I absolutely loved, kind of maybe thought you might go there a little bit more philosophical and spiritual. And I greatly appreciate that and hope that we actually can get you back in the podcast uh, another day uh, to to keep going deeper on that. Yeah, that I great. actually have, I've got two players. Uh, one's a senior here and mm -hmm. one's a guy that's just above my ear, Oso Iguodaro, who just graduated and is now in the NBA. Um, and we have three times a week, I send them a journal prompt and it all centers around the question, who am I and who am I not? Um, mm. And it's fascinating stuff that they write. Fascinating. Mm. Man, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. And thanks for being here on the podcast. Really appreciate you guys having me. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Coach. So as we wrap up, I just want to highlight one final thing. Um, there are many principles or mantras that Shaka uses. Um, phrases like get over yourself and the three A's, awareness, acceptance, action. And that one uh, more recent for him, which is not good enough, it's okay. Now, these are great mantras. They're great principles. They're great coachisms. But what is important is that they are lived out in his behavior in the way that he treats others. And it kind of comes back to what he shared there at the end. Like you can write a, a book on culture. You could write a 24 page manual on culture, like theory and principles. They're easy. It's actually executing. That's the hard part. And the way that he is able to live his principles out to execute on his culture plan is through personal disciplines, habits, and growth. He, I mean, he continuously references his morning routine throughout our discussion, as well as the mentors in his life and his executive coach. Um, and I love how he not only just talks about how this is a journey for him, but how he talks about how he brings his players and his coaches on that journey. And I think this is one of the most powerful ways to lead is to build disciplines in your life, good habits, and then teach them to your people. And go on this journey together, like grow together. The relationships where we grow together are the ones that are really, truly transformational. All right, that's it for our interview with Shaka Smart. Thanks so much for him for making the time. Uh, and thank you to all our listeners for listening in. Please be sure to subscribe and leave us a review if you have not done those two things already, as well as if you found today's episode valuable, please share it. Um, send it via text to a friend or email or even better, throw it out there on social media. Uh, we always appreciate those shout outs.